everyone. Um, we will look today at the concept of second language pedagogy. Now, um, I have included on in the inside of the modules some PowerPoints and some discussions and some papers. But as always, I would prefer to give you a um, podcast, which I create when just when, when it's relevant for you, just to summarize everything that we have done in the modules or have covered in the modules, and maybe add some things that might simplify things for you or might answer some questions that maybe the recordings in the modules actually did not make it too clear. So first of all, as the entire world is running and looking for a method of teaching or for a holy process and all of those things, uh, you will see that in, when you work with me, we work in terms of pedagogy, which, in terms of a pedagogy which actually um, give, is not based on any specific model as such, but what it does actually do is for, uh, puts to the forefront the concept of student power. So we're very interested in a learning environment whereby we do the things that the curriculum asks us to do, which means to um, support a form of learning which enables students to develop an international culturally sensitive disposition as well as learn also more about their own country and their own um, context as part of the larger community. So this is not to say that we're learning French in order to learn in, uh, about Australia, but we, when we actually talk to people uh, in French or in Chinese, we would like to be able to actually uh, have some understanding of Australia that we could share with those people without actually having a right so I don't have to make this point anymore everybody understands it okay so the principles of student power I haven't gotten them from anywhere it's David Rock David, it's, it's David Rock's article on student res, on, on resilience actually in in organizations in professional organizations but from everything I read these actually terms quite nicely allow us to capture the concept of student power. We want in our pedagogies to create conditions where students feel relevant, you can't argue that, where they have a status, where they can exercise their autonomy, which means have some deg degree of control, right? Autonomy, so it's not, they're not always uh, pliable peons to, doing what we tell them, but actually they have a sense, they can exercise their autonomy, they have a sense of control, a sense of certainty, which means that uh, crazy things don't happen around, but they can actually feel safe. And there is a sense of fairness, which means that uh, our assessment actually reflects the expectations uh, that we set up for our students through our support in our teaching. Right? So we don't want students to uh, perform fabulously, and all we gave them is just some grammar drills. And then we asked them assignment questions, which is, could you create an advertisement for French television? Right? And all we did is uh, um, Mireille forgot her gloves in some silly, you know, texts, books, uh, texts and activities, which is something I remember when I was doing French, you know, Mireille forgot her gloves in a taxi. I don't know how much it actually a text of this kind would help me to be in France or to talk to anyone about anything, but that's what we were studying back then. So it's a sense of fairness. If we want commu communicative assessment, we also have to actually produce conditions to allow students to succeed. And so you will see that all my pedagogy is about support. It's about support to um, comply with the curriculum and support so that students actually are given a chance to engage in the learning in a way that they don't feel on their own, that they have resources and they can be creative and critical while uh, working with those resources, human resources or otherwise, uh, internet, any resources that you will create and so on. So here it is, this is my intellectual framework, right? A student who has to actually uh, put the language somehow together in their own head, they cannot just take it from our head. So what we need to do is to support this process. So I will be using the concept of play 
uh, I used to talk about exploratory learning, it's the same thing. Whether you do exploratory learning or play, same thing apply, which is that a student is at the center, but a supported student, because we don't actually want to lock up a child in the room with no toys and then say to them, play. They might for a minute or two, but after a while, they'll be banging their head against the walls, right? So play and exploratory learning are the same. Critical pedagogy is the same, which means enable, uh, enabling students to have access to have to have access to resources they can explore, they can play with, construct connections, and make informed choices in regard to what actually works for a particular context in which they want to communicate. It's as simple as this. So we have some other nice definitions of play here. Some more you can read for yourself. Okay, this is just the history of load teaching, right? Don't worry about it. I'm not going to teach you the history of load teaching because we're over this. But um, just to summarize, in the past, we had a behavioral, a behavioristic model, which was about compliance. I do, you mimic. Um, and that probably didn't work, right? Because it doesn't matter how many times I say, nice change, Liefsha. A person who doesn't speak Polish, speaks English, can't hear it, can't repeat it. So we, we used to have these drills. Hear this, please repeat. Well, nobody could repeat it. So the behaviorism kind of is through the window. Then we have the idea that, you know, and, and there is still some, some bits of this hanging around the curriculum and some old discourses, but knowledge is skills. So once you acquire all those little uh, particles of skills, all these little items, uh, because you itemize learning, in, you divide it into skills, or you itemize knowledge, you divide it into skills. Once you put them all in a, uh, in a heap, then you have a qualified student. Well, we found that, but actually that doesn't work either because a person is not a set of skills. We can talk about knowledge as a set of skills. We can talk about it, but it doesn't mean that the person is a set of skills. So now, hardly anyone talks about learning as information management, but that's what it is. People probably talk about construction, but construction is nothing else but reorganization, which is information management, right? It's reorganization because every time you learn a new, you, 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 um, you learn things or you acquire uh, I won't have to use those old terms, you acquire new knowledge, there's not such a thing. What happens is you are exposed to a challenge and in order to address challenge, you explore what you know, you, you reorganize what you know, and now you know differently. You have now reorganized information in your head in relation to the challenge you encountered, and therefore this reorganization I call information management. So that's Anya Lyon. Uh, it doesn't come from me, didn't pop out from my head today, but it's a, an accumulation of different readings and different frameworks, and this is how I talk about it. So because it involves, at any rate, if anyone were to actually put a reference to this information management, it's not just Anya Lyon, but it, I actually drew on it from different people. One of them is Anne Friedman's article where she talks about, it's there in module four, I think, but you don't have to read it. It's a very complex article, but it's about culture. And I refer to it in my other paper where I talk about um, literacy teaching and it also is about load. So what she says, when we encounter a challenge, we, then, we don't get terrified and die. What we do, we look back and explore our own resources of our own knowledge so that we can then think how what we know can help us to address new challenge and in order to do that we have to reorganize things because obviously how it was organized to begin with was not sufficient we had to look play with what we know and then reorganize it and then address the challenge now this is a very primitive way to do it a better way to do it is actually to give students access to resources that not only allow them to reorganize what they know but also create little challenges themselves, smaller challenges, because they actually guide in this way uh, students in addressing 
what they know and re therefore as a result reorganize more aspects of their knowledge right because one encounter with the challenge can only generate this much of reorganization in the students but if you give students resources which allow them to probe uh, what they know in more than one way then they actually activate many knowledge systems and as a result the process or the final outcome of this information organization is actually quite larger the scope is bigger and therefore the learning or the information organization that actually occurred as a result is more powerful so here it is intellectual framework my pedagogy now um of obviously you are by now quite across it because we've looked at it in many different ways so we have capabilities cur curriculum priorities that we need to consider and i have also uh in in the other um text that i have shared with you which was the table as you remember what i have also um raised with you is the is the meaning of those capabilities so for example when you actually want to construct or act in a community context with particular interlocutors you actually consider your audiences you, and but then if you consider your audiences and the intentions that motivate your uh, engagement with those people you you cannot just talk so for example when your students encounter a challenge of creating say they want what they would this is just for argument's sake right a, 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 a one day on indonesian or chinese television obviously when they think of their audiences they, they don't know them so what they need to do is to actually think for themselves what kind of um, cultural expectations are that this is a sophisticated obviously task uh, for uh, for students but that, that uh, just gives me a good example here so they need to actually learn about the different um, shows that are on uh, Chinese television what kind of audiences they target what is known about those people and so on and so forth in order to actually get that information about audiences so it doesn't matter whether it's a uh, television audiences or whether it's a um, person you're meeting in China or peers you're meeting on Skype you still need to actually build some understanding of your people of those people you're going to interact with and you can only do it if you are, were given access to resources which is that critical and creative capabilities right you were given access to resources that enable you to actually explore confront your understandings of what you think Chinese people are like what they think like what they do right all these in different contexts and so on so to understand you need to you can't understand by someone explaining it to you which is what uh, in the past was done but that was only because we those old methods which you probably will uh, carry with you uh, because of your past experiences in learning a language some of you um, were constructed the way they were because we didn't have technology we didn't have resources at our fingertips the world has changed so anyone who teaches a language from a textbook honestly belongs to the last century and that's long time ago right we're not into textbooks we have internet we have skype we have all kinds of resources that i discuss in uh, mo in the modules and i will just repeat here so that you actually uh, are reminded of it so and and once students are given these possibilities to explore what these people are what these people do what they what these people wear and how you know what can we learn about different people in different contexts what happens you support the creative and critical capabilities because what you do you give them a chance you give students information to select from to play with right and you cannot think critically unless you have information to select from you can't critically means evaluation you can't evaluate unless you have actually some range of information from which you can actually on the basis of which you can make these informed choices and creativity is support because because then you can actually play with these understandings you can learn from them and then organize them in a new way more interesting way than, it, than it, the way it was presented to you so you can actually now you have more information and you can play with it to generate new things now as you as a teacher 
uh, provide this type of resources and, and activities that enable students to actually explore um, their understandings of the people, of their audiences in China. What you need to do is to think about the range. And this is what we were doing in that table. Um, I can't go back to that table that we were creating in the module one and two because uh, I'm recording the screen and it's just the computer is not managing very well. But the idea is that when you actually give people the idea of who are the Chinese people, you don't actually stereotype them or who are the Japanese people. You show them that there are regions, that these regions have particular uh, you know, geographical and historical context and so on and so on. You make it, you make it amazing to those students, right? So depending on what range of resources you make available to students, not only uh, the, the message of your unit will not only be interesting or boring, but it will also be giving students a particular understanding about, about uh, the people that your resources legitimize. So you may think, oh, it doesn't matter if we don't divide the Chinese people to 50 some sort of states and so on, or, or if we don't actually give um, our students enough of a history, right? But then if you think that, turn it back to Australia and say, well, it doesn't matter if we don't tell students about the Aboriginals being that much different and so on. That's just, that's, that we're all speaking English here, right? So let's just give them English about, and let's make Australia English, right? So what you do in the little move of forgetfulness, what you do, you eliminate people from the country and you actually not just eliminate them, you invalidate them. And then with that, you invalidate cultural practices of the region. And then when people want to engage with Australia, uh, say, because, they, you know, for whatever reason, that bit is like being blind in one eye. Right? So that's why it's important that when we choose resources, uh, for, on the basis of which our students will be learning about their audiences and about the differences and about, you know, they will be creating expectations with which they will enter China. It's important that we actually validate the cultures and the people that are there, not invalidate them. And then the understandings, the personal and social capabilities, the understandings they will build about, build about their audiences will be informed. And as a result, as students learn about other people, they also learn about themselves. Because if they learn that there are regions, there are histories, there are geographical positions, there are also climate conditions, they can actually also think, what does this mean to me in relation to my interaction with them, but also in relation to the way I live, right? So that, so that whole knowledge that they are gaining as a result of as a result of the, as a result of these exploratory activities and resources you provide for them. Some of them in Chinese, obviously, and or whatever language, and some of them in um, English. What they do, their own self-esteem, self sense sense of self grows. Not just understanding of the other, but also of self. Now I'm not quite sure. Uh, how much I have given you in the modules and how much I want to actually now continue giving you because it doesn't matter at this very moment we will actually move in with the concept of evidence for assignment too. Um, but yes, everything that I tell you uh, that it's valuable in terms of pedagogy is based on evidence. Not necessarily evidence always the way constru constructed the way how people in education think of evidence. That's because um, Education has to catch up with a lot of things, and and we are doing, uh, you know, quite a lot of work nowadays to actually update ourselves and so on. But what happens very often in education is that we're thinking about does this work? Does this work? But what we're actually not asking ourselves is is questions about the students, about the way they perceive things, the way they organize th things, the way the br the brain works, and so on. Now, in language teaching, and especially say in my own research and the, re the research of my teams with which I actually work, we've asked ourselves these questions for decades. But somehow these questions are more relevant in language teaching because you know we have very visible very visible problems like a person who speaks English has to now pronounce things in a French way or in a Chinese way. So they're very visible perception problems, whereas uh, those perceptions problems somehow escape people in regular uh, education subjects. So um, 
if not for this assignment, assignment one, we will, we will look into evidence, the concept of evidence for assignment two. But one thing that I did want to make sure is whatever evidence we will be discussing in assignment two, all of that evidence has one center point, which is the student power, and we've discussed that. I might divide this video into two parts, which will be this, the first part will be the theoretical load part, and the second part will be actually the practice. So I'll just finish, uh, finish off with a couple of statements. Um, so in order to actually enable uh, enable this exploratory, critically informed, what else they call play-based uh, learning environment. We need a, a, a structure, a structure of our learning, uh, of our of our pedagogy or learning conditions. Call it whatever you want. So um, I've divided um, the learning uh, sequence into three um, into three stages. Now for your um, assignment. See how much you can actually encompass. If you feel that you have put a lot of work into the engagement and evaluation um, phases, probably evaluation is not that hard. Anyway, the, um, the, just judge for yourself how for yourselves how much actually uh, you will what, what will be the volume of your work for assignment one. I just want to see a comprehensive um, description with all the resources from the internet, with uh, but anything that actually allows me to know that you know where to find resources for your, uh, for, uh, for, for to support students learning, that you know that you, you know the web, you know you know the web relevant uh, to your load, and that so I need to see actually all the links and so on in in your thing. So I need I need to see a comprehensive organization of this resource, but if you feel at some stage that this is just five. Um, what do I call it? Five teaching plans. So that would probably like be like five to eight hours of work, probably. If you feel that whatever you have, oh, I don't know. But just if you feel that it just covers five uh, teaching plans, five lessons and so on, that's fine with me. But you will see it's not that difficult to actually cover all the three stages, but you might not be actually um, able to finish completely uh, the phase three. But let's have a look. So anyway, so we have three phases. The first one is an exploratory phase, which is actually consistent with what I was saying in terms of the curriculum, that we need to actually give students uh, a, a chance to actually do this exploratory work, right? So they actually um, need to actually know something about the environment in which they will be interacting. Now, typically what happens is that the teacher will, uh, and this is the question I had from a student from our lot subject, um, there's a dilemma, of course, because typically teachers design tasks for students and students do them. But then what we are failing here is to do the things we have said here, which is the students feel relevant. How are they relevant when we told them what to do? That's a bit of too much of compliance and control. Um, Right, so when you so when you remove the power from students to actually decide what they want to do, then those power ingredients, the student power ingredients I have here on the bottom, uh, I uh, outlined, they kind of look a bit more shaky. So we need to find a way in a, a teaching pedagogy where we can actually preserve them. And therefore, maybe not start exploration toward exp so that so that the phase of exploration or so the phase of engagement will not be about getting students to do a particular task we invented, but maybe it's a the it's it's the it's a phase instead to engage students in an exploration of the load environment. So China, Greece. Japan, France, so they explore it, and as a result of this exploration and particular tools we give them so that they can actually 
have some freedom from the teacher and explore in a meaningful way, but not always be told what things are and how things are, but sometimes actually exercise some degree of control and autonomy. Can we give them some tools that they can actually explore stuff on their own or in groups rather than always controlled by the teacher? There are many problems with the ongoing control of the teacher is that if you have 25 students or 16 students in your classroom or sometimes eight students, doesn't matter, even one, what happens is that we're all doing together same stuff. And students have different questions, different interests, and they want to click here and play here and ask this person and find out that. And that one teacher is not enough. So if we give students resources so that they can engage with the context of load through exploration, but also by giving tools that enable them to actually make sense of stuff on their own or in groups rather than continuously referring back to the teacher. That's something, isn't it? That's something new and kind of um, bol uh, bolstering their interests and also enabling them to do things which are personally relevant to them as opposed to relevant to the task with the teacher pre-designed for them. So as a result, you can see from this drawing, as a result of this engagement phase, what students might at the end want to do some summary with you, a summary of what they found out. And a summary might actually prompt them then to identify a project they would want to do. You see, so the project actually arises or emerges from their explorations as opposed to from you telling them. Now, obviously you're a teacher, and you're in control of what they explore. So uh, if you can think that you can actually think for yourself what kind of things you think would be v valuable for them to explore, then you just make them available to them. But you do not come into the classroom saying, today we're gonna we will design a tourist book, or today we will write a text on something, right? So you don't do that. So then once students have done the evaluation phase and where they actually evaluated their area explorations and identified the project they want to do, now you will want to engage with students in actually going into more detail, which is to, ident so, so, to do the plan, right? To do the plan, identify the objectives of the projects, identify what they will want to pursue things they want to explore and, and learn about, uh, design collaboration, like for example, even when students work in groups, so students will say to each other, well, we'll do this together, but some things we do separately and then we'll bring it into the group so we can actually compare and contrast because it's better than fi that five of us does exploration of things and just all of us working on the same thing, right? It's a waste of time. So obviously as a group, we can evaluate, compare, contrast, and maybe follow up, but certainly you, uh, engaging also individuals in uh, explorations on their own is very valuable too, right? So then what I'm saying to you is that group work is not just a group work, it's individuals, so group designing the, their uh, project and um, how they're gonna work with it, then giving responsibilities to individuals. Individuals do some work, bring it to the group, group evaluates. Group might even make a presentation to the whole classroom on each stage of their progress. And other groups will also make presentations. So everybody is learning from everyone else. And then back again, uh, uh, not necessarily to the drawing board, but basically to continue with the project to, through the next phase. So when students actually, once students have done their exploration, in order to actually assist them in evaluating their findings, I'll, I suggest to you particular questions so you can keep them in mind, have them written somewhere as you teach. And basically the questions that are here draw on the capabilities, but as you, as you discuss the findings with the students, pardon me, as you discuss the findings with the students, keep in mind always their priorities, which is the indigenous connections, the Asian connection, and the community or orientation, which is the sustainability. Sustainability can be resources, but it can also be 
community uh, sustainability, so community connection. So there are some there are some guiding questions here. I don't have to read them. You can read them for yourselves. Nothing binding about them, but just good ideas. And then when students actually start designing their project, the, the, these, um, these, these are high level questions, so you can keep them in your head and whether you will um, um, share them with your students in the particular form that you can see them here on the screen or whether you can actually simplify them. One, way I, one, one thing that needs to be said that these questions actually are designed specifically for you to uh, for you to not lose the track from the curriculum, so not go off the track. So they actually are drawing on the curriculum those questions. And as you will be um, helping them to with the design of their project, design of the questions they have to pursue, you also keep in mind two things that that the uh, priorities are considered and that when you actually supply students with resources so that they can actually ad address those questions, but th that your uh, resources also keep in mind the priorities, right? So, so the curriculum is continuously engaged. In the load structure that we discussed before in, in ACARA, there are uh, particular dispositions or outcomes or dispositions actually outlined there for load, for your particular load. So you also make sure that once um, students get on with um, developing the projects and creating things, that your resources that you facilitated actually allow them to address uh, those uh, dispositions or those outcomes that are identified for each of the language in that uh, load structure. So that's very important that you actually account for it. And that's also about fairness, right? So they are written up there, but students cannot attend them unless throughout the process of the constructing of the project, they actually had access to examples and resources that, uh, and, and tools that ensure their success in that regard. So this is the theoretical part that I wanted to cover with you, and I'll move to the practical part in the next, in the next video. Thank you.